Hi, I'm Sam Sells, and welcome to my podcast, Clean Money. I like to say investing matters, and my show is to talk with everyday folks that are not only creating great success, but making an impact in society and improving the lives of others. That is my mission, and I want to share my stories and others with you. Welcome to Clean Money. Thank you for joining us again today for another great episode of Clean Money, where we talk about making a difference in the world through our investments of time and resources. My guest today is uh, exceptionally uh, successful, ex- just a wealth of knowledge and understanding, super smart, and he's cool, so you'll like him. It's Jimmy Atkinson. Jimmy is the co-founder of The Wealth Channel, the leading community for high net worth individuals and advisors who place capital and alternate investments. He is also the host of Opportunity Zones and Private Equity Show, uh, the number one show for high net worth in- investors and advisors who place capital in qualified opportunity funds and other private equity funds. So don't listen to him before you listen to my channel. After this, go listen to a much better podcast host and enjoy Jimmy's show um, on the Wealth, Wealth Channel. Thank you for joining us, Jimmy. <laughs> hey, Sam. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Um, so tell me a little bit about, you know, your history, where, you know, where you've come from and, and why you have a gold football helmet behind you. (laughs) Great questions. Well, the gold football helmet actually has a lot to do with my past and where it all began. Uh, I start, I'm a serial entrepreneur, but I formed my first business with, my college roommate in our dorm room at the University of Notre Dame. And that is a Notre Dame football helmet behind yeah. me there. I'm a Notre Dame fan. I went to Notre Dame. I didn't play football for Notre Dame. I'm way too small. <laughs> but uh, yeah. but we we started our first business in our dorm room about 20 years ago. And Andy Hagens, my college uh, roommate, he's still my business partner. He's been my longtime business partner on and off over the last 20 years. And we have successfully grown, created, grown, scaled, and exited multiple businesses uh, over that 20-year period. And along the way, we've done some private equity investing. We've become LPs and some passive real estate funds, some private venture capital funds. So I I started to learn a lot more about investing. And I started an Opportunity Zones website about four or five years ago. I think we'll talk about it a little bit later. But that eventually kind of morphed into Wealth Channel, uh, which we launched a couple of years back as Alts DB. We recently rebranded it as Wealth Channel just a few months ago. And as you read in the intro, it's the number one community for high net worth investors who place capital into alternative investments. Uh, the types of alternative investments that Andy and I have learned a lot about over the course of our careers. Well, tell me a little bit about that. So our listeners may not know what an alternative investment is. All right. And so they may think, oh, okay, so instead of investing in stocks, I'm investing in real estate. Is that what that means? Um, So explain that a little bit, and then we can talk about opportunity zones, because uh, I hear about these all the time. I talk about them all the time. I bought property on the line on the wrong side of the street before. That was not an opportunity zone, and it cost us money. We could have made more money if we bought one on the other side of the street. So first, you know, what are alternative investments? And then let's talk about the OZs. Yeah. Uh, if you ask a few, if you ask uh, like 10 different people to define alternative investments, you might get 10 slightly different answers. But the way we define it is anything that can't be easily bought or sold through a brokerage account. So when we think of traditional investments, we think of stocks, bonds, mutual funds, exchange traded funds, or, or ETFs, anything that you can easily sell on your account, whether that's with Vanguard or Fidelity or TD Ameritrade or whomever you use. Alternative investments we define as more illiquid, non-publicly traded assets. And the, you're right to point out that it is largely real estate. The The largest asset class within alternative investments, is least, at least as how we define it, is real estate. You could also consider gold or cryptocurrency or art or comic books or other collectibles to be other forms of alternative investments. Those alternative investments are a little bit more speculative and we don't cover those types of alternative investments so much. We like to stick with real estate. We also stick with energy, oil and gas. 
We have also covered farmland, ag tech products, um, and also some private debt and some private equity products as well. So that's how we define alternative investments. So which of those alternative investments is your primary focus? What do you like the most out of those? So nothing speculative. So you're not doing baseball cards or mm -hmm. Game of Thrones cards if there are any, I don't know, but you know, um, digital pictures and whatever. So like, where do you place your focus on in that world? Yeah, we place our focus um, primarily on the on the asset classes that I just mentioned. And real estate really is the 800 pound gorilla in the room. It's it's the most popular asset class for the investors in our community and for me personally as well. And now I'll take you on a, a detour into opportunity zones. We consider opportunity zones or more specifically the qualified opportunity fund wrapper to be mm -hmm. a subset of alternative investments. Uh, qualified opportunity funds by and large, for the most part, invest into real estate that is located in census tracts that have been federally designated as qualified opportunity zones. So that's a large part of our focus is covering that industry specifically. Uh, and so we started that website. I should say I started that website on my own. I kind of went out uh, as a maverick in 2018, uh, apart from my business partners who were working on some other projects and I founded the Opportunity Zones database at opportunitydb.com to cover this new micro niche of alternative investments. It was a brand new tax policy that was brought into existence at the end of 2017. Uh, I don't know how how granular you want me to get about it, Sam. Maybe I'll maybe I'll stop there and and see if you have a follow up question for me. Which direction you want me to go in here? Yeah, let's. Um, so. I've been on that website numerous times over the past, I don't know, at least a year, maybe two years. Um, explain though, uh, and, and this is awesome to get kind of the genesis of how that all started. Um, but talk a little bit, I guess, just in big picture, what is an opportunity zone? What is the federal government um, doing, our state governments doing um, when they assign something as an opportunity zone? What's the point? Yeah, great question. So I'll go back to the end of the last great recession that we had, the, coming out of the financial crisis of 07 through 09, roughly. Uh, what we saw was a, an uneven recovery period for the country. The nation's wealthiest zip codes uh, recovered quite, quite easily and surpassed their economic activity uh, pre-recession whereas the nation's poorest zip codes were largely left behind. So you had this, the nation was going down this path and then the recession happened. And then we had kind of had two paths at this fork in the road where the wealthy zip codes recovered great. The poorest zip codes did even worse after that, after that recession. And there was this uh, effort by a few and actually was spearheaded um by the uh, the 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 founder of Napster and former Facebook um, president, um, I can't think of his name off the top of my head now. I'm drawing a blank on on who that is. But he partnered with a an individual called uh, Steve Glickman. Maybe you can look that up for me, Sam. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, I'm I can, I'm thinking of his face. I'm like, oh no. I'm... Yeah. The 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 Napster founder. Well, it'll come to mind. Um, but he he was a uh, very Parker. wealthy. Sean Parker, yeah. Sean Parker teamed up with uh, an individual called uh, Steve Glickman in the mid-2010s to work on this new concept of trying to incentivize private capital to flow into these poor, these, these, these areas in the country, these zip codes that got left behind, essentially, from the, from the recession. So I think they started that in around 2014 or 2015. Um, they formed a think tank called the Economic Innovation Group, and they created a white paper about that very concept. And then they create a solution, which they termed economic opportunity zones. And so uh, a few years later, they were actually able to, over the course of the next few years, they were able to, to bring on, through their lobbying efforts, several senators and several congressmen 
to co-sponsor this piece of legislation called the Investing in Opportunity Act. And that act uh, eventually got packaged into uh, President Trump's big tax bill at the end of 2017. That tax bill was, I don't know, five, six, 700 pages long. Yeah, sure. The Opportunity Zones provision in that tax bill is about this big. I think it's just, I think it's only about six pages, uh, but it gave birth to Opportunity Zones as we know them. And what transpired next, the legislation was passed at the end of 2017. Mm -hmm. That legislation did two things. One, it defined a mechanism by which all of the states around the country could nominate certain locations within their states to become opportunity zones. And then the second thing it did was it created a huge tax incentive, what I've deemed to be possibly the greatest tax incentive ever created for investors to invest private capital, private equity into these locations. So then over the course of the next six, seven months, at the beginning of 2018 through about about mid-July of 2018, all of the governors from all over the country, plus the mayor of DC and the governors of all of the overseas territories, including Puerto Rico, the, the mm -hmm. biggest one, they were able to designate up to 25% of their low income census tracts. So not zip codes, but census tracts as qualified opportunity zones. And, and now we have this map of the country that has different opportunity zones and they're dotted all over the place. California has over 800 opportunity zones. Texas has several hundred. Uh, even the the more rural, less populated states like Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, those all of those smaller states, larger geographic area, but smaller populated states have at least 25 opportunity zones in them. Washington D.C. has 25 opportunity zones. Puerto Rico. Um, was granted a, a special exception to the rule of 25% in order to help them recover from the earthquakes and the hurricanes yeah. of around that same period, the late 2010s. Um, they were granted the ability to, de to designate all of their low-income census tracts as opportunity zones. So nearly the entire island of Puerto Rico is an opportunity zone. So that's that was step one. Now, step two of the legislation defined what the tax benefits were. Mm -hmm. And the tax benefits are massive. Um, and it's similar to a 1031 exchange in some ways. If your audience may be familiar with that, you have to start with a capital gain. Right. And then if you roll over that gain within a certain time period into an opportunity zone fund that invests into assets located in those federally designated zones, then you get two huge benefits. One is you get to defer recognition of your initial gain until the end of 2026. This is essentially an interest-free loan from Uncle Sam for a few years. And then number two, if you hold your opportunity zone investment for at least 10 years, any appreciation of that investment gets no taxation whatsoever. So you get to completely escape capital gains taxes on the subsequent opportunity zone investment. Again, so long as you hold it for at least 10 years. It's a perishable tax incentive. It's set to expire after the end of 2026, um, unless we get some reform legislation from Congress. But the ability to essentially eliminate capital gains liability on, on an investment in an opportunity zone, that's, that's what drew a lot of attention. It got my attention. It got a lot of headlines in 2018. And, uh, the, and it, it, it's led to quite a few success stories in the industry. That's phenomenal. And, and, you know, thinking as you're talking about the tax incentives and uh, as we've looked at, you know, there's a seven year, eight year, nine year, 10 year inside of the opportunity zone uh, asset. And there's different um, hurdles, I guess, would be one way to say it. But um, the incredible power of the tax incentive is not well known or widely known, even though it's been around for a few years. Um, and it's just, a, a, if nothing else, it's a reminder that investing in real estate is from a, a tax strategy is the best. It's just the best thing. There's so many different ways to not pay taxes or to avoid taxes and uh, not a, uh, legally avoid taxes because the law was written 
uh, you know, what is it like 92% or 98% is all just how to not pay taxes and the small port is what you do pay on. So um, I find it incredible. And the more I've learned about um, opportunity zones, the more I know that that needs to be part of my future strategy. So how, how would a regular investor who is doing different things or tired of maybe they sold stocks or lost money in stocks because everybody loses money in stocks at some point, right? It's just the nature of the beast. Um, but then you sell on your gain and you pay, I don't know, 30% or whatever in taxes and you realize that that was really dumb. Um, what's the option? Where do people go to find out more? Uh, how do they um, learn more about how to invest? And, and I know you talk about this on your channel, so maybe this is a good opportunity to um, segue there. Yeah, and, and it's good of you to point out the the stock example. Um, just to quickly draw a comparison between a similar program, the 1031 exchange versus Opportunity Zones. 1031s, your, your viewers, your listeners, Sam, may be familiar with, especially if they're real estate investors, that program's been around for literally 100 years. It essentially allows you to continually defer uh, capital gains taxation on your real estate investments. You can keep essentially trading up without having to pay capital gains tax on different investment properties. Opportunity zones are somewhat similar, but the gain can come from anywhere with opportunity zones. It doesn't have to come from real estate. So you can sell a portion of your stock portfolio. You can also exit a privately held business. Anything that generates any sort of capital gain, that gain can be rolled over into an opportunity zone fund and then receive access to all of the benefits that I I just laid out. And the, the other important distinction is that with a 1031, you don't step up to fair market value until uh, you pass away. And that that ultimate benefit gets passed on to your heirs. With opportunity zones, that takes place just after 10 years. So it's a little bit of a shortcut, I guess, and, and it, there's some more uh, flexibility with the type of gain. Um, there's a lot of other differences between the two programs, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. For now, but you're to get at the heart of your question, Sam, where can investors go to learn more about these different types of products? Well, that's why I started OpportunityDB.com, the Opportunity Zones database. We have a database of all of the different geographic zones. There's exactly 8,764 of them all over the country. As I mentioned, they're, they're in every state in the country. There's at least 25 in every state and jurisdiction. And then there's there's several hundred in some of the larger, more populated states. But then it's also a database of not all of the different funds, but at least most of the different Opportunity Zone funds that are being offered to outside investors and who are raising money from outside investors. We have a, a database of um, over 100 funds that are currently open for investment from high net worth investors and that's why we've been able to attract a lot of investors onto our platform and into our subscription base uh, to, to be able to view those funds and, and, and see what is out there. We also offer an event series that we put on three times a year called OZ Pitch Day, where we showcase a dozen different qualified opportunity funds that are currently open and accepting equity investments from outside investors very popular with our high net worth investor community and the advisors who serve them to come to that event. It's an online event. It's free to attend, by the way, but registration is required. Uh, we do those every March, July, and November. So whenever you're watching or viewing this, we probably have one coming up very soon. And you can learn more on our website, opportunitydb.com. Excellent. Thank you. Um, it's just, it's, uh, it's a niche that a lot of people don't know, but it's in, like you said, so incredibly powerful. Um, getting out there and helping people to be able to see like the exact you know zip code, the the streets and everything where it is um, is you know how I've learned that you know the opportunity zone is ten feet that direction um, on some of our properties. We're like ah oh, you know we just missed out, uh, but it's we've had investors come to us in the past saying hey. I sold this thing. I've got all this cash. I can't 1031 it because of X, Y, Z. Do you guys have an opportunity zone? And I've, frankly, I was like, well, we don't right now. Um, and I don't know where to send you um, because I 
you know, all the other guys that I know are either syndicating or they're built to rent or they're doing things on their own or, or something else. And so it's great. Now I have a resource to send folks to um, go check out uh, Jimmy and listen to his podcast, look at his show and, and get involved here because this is a tax strategy you do not want to miss. What a great opportunity. So you started the wealth um, channel. Sorry. You started the wealth channel. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I was able to have quite a bit of success with Opportunity DB. I had a very large following. I had a large email list. I was doing really well with my uh, podcast listener base. Uh, but in the back of my mind the whole time, I was thinking, this is, this is great. This is a good micro niche, um, but the market isn't that big. Uh, you know, it, it, it caters to high net worth and a very specific type of high net worth investor, family office and advisor, very valuable audience, but it caters to a very specific subset of those types of people. And specifically those who have recently generated or are episodically generating capital gains. And Frankly, the 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 tax incentive is great. I, I I believe it is one of the greatest tax incentives ever created. I'm in a handful of qualified opportunity funds myself, but I recognize that it's it's not an appropriate strategy for everybody. Um, there are some hurdles, and so I wanted to. Well, the other thing is the tax incentive itself is perishable. It is right. set to expire at the end of 2026. So I've built this great following. I'm building this great business. Uh, but it's the 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 market isn't huge. It's gonna possibly go away at the end of 2026 unless Congress extends the program, and they haven't so far. So I'm thinking in the back of my mind this whole time, hey, I should try to pivot at some point, or at least expand my footprint to cover something a little bit more comprehensive. So at the end of what year was it? Uh, it was at the end of 2020, 2020. At the end of 2020 or 2021, somewhere in that time range, um, we it was the end of 2021. I we launched. I brought in a few new partners, and we launched a new platform called AltsDB, the Alternative Investment Database. That has since rebranded to Wealth Channel. And what Wealth Channel does is it covers the entire alternative investments industry. That then again, we're using the definition that I gave. In my yeah. introduction a few minutes ago, we cover primarily private placement offerings for real estate, for energy, oil and gas, for ag tech. We cover private equity, we cover venture capital, uh, th those types of investments. We don't really necessarily cover the more speculative end of that spectrum. Um, and the entire purpose there is really to create a community for high net worth investors, ultra high net worth investors, family offices, and advisors who place capital into alternative assets. So we educate on how to build generational wealth with these types of assets. Look, these are how the ultra wealthy individuals around this country, the billionaires are investing. Here's how you can access some of these products. So to that end, we have an event series through that platform as well um, that we're calling the Wealth Channel Expo. We do those three times a year. We're going to start rolling out some in-person events pretty soon here as well, uh, toward the middle of this year. And then we have a podcast on that channel as well called the Alternative Investment Podcast, which I'm the occasional co-host on or guest host on, but is mainly hosted by my business partner, Andy Hagens. Awesome. That's a lot. You just, you've shifted, you've moved, you've flexed, you see... Uh what's happening in the market. You see the political games they play, right? So 100% cost segregation has decreased. They do that kind of stuff mm -hmm. so that they can try and get reelected, right? <laughs> uh, well, you know, you guys are all gonna lose this money unless I, you reelect me or my, you know, whomever. So um, you flex now and you've created this database because data, data is it, right? People need that data. Um, we talk about it all the time. And so I just want to highlight something you said. You, you said this is where people can go and find out how uh, the ultra uh, high net worth individuals are investing their money. Now, 
five years ago before I got started doing commercial real estate, I had no idea what a ultra high net worth individual even meant. I grew up in Oklahoma. I was dirt poor, then moved to Texas. I, you know, was in the military. People think like, if you're a millionaire, you've made it in life. But the thinking process, how people invest their money, um, where they invest their money, how they think about that stuff is so much different um, at different levels of the socioeconomic classes in the world, everywhere, right? Everywhere. And so you've you've um, tapped into this system. You created an opportunity for others to tap into this system and to see what's going on. Um, is that wealth channel for anybody in a kid in Oklahoma who's barely got you know internet? Can they go in and I don't know why they have to be in Oklahoma. I just said that, but um, you know, can they go in and check that out and see what's happening and change their mindset a little bit? Or is this just- yeah, we invite yeah, we invite everybody to check out our website and to listen to the podcast. And I think anybody in the country can can glean some insight, some knowledge from some of the discussions we have with some of our guests on the podcast for sure. Now that said, we really cater to accredited investors, which are essentially investors who have at least $1 million net worth, millionaires and and up, essentially. And the reason for that is uh, just about every alternative investment product that you find, non-liquid, privately offered fund, is going to require that you meet the definition of an accredited investor which a, a, a shortcut to that is essentially you are at, worth at least a million dollars excluding your primary residence, or you have a certain level of income, at least $200,000 or $300,000 if you file jointly with a spouse. Um, that is an SEC rule. That is not us projecting any type of rule onto our fund. That is That comes from the Securities and Exchange Commission that regulates the, um, the alternative investments industry. They require that these funds for the most part, 99% of the time, there's some exceptions, take money in only from investors that meet that criteria. So th- those are the types of products that we cover. Those are the types of products that we showcase on our event series as well. And our events actually are for accredited investors only. So if you want to come to one of our live events, you do have to meet that definition uh, because legally speaking, some of these funds aren't able to present their products unless they know that the audience is uh, composed of accredited investors only. And the point of that, um, to piggyback on what you just said, the S- Security Exchange Commission developed these rules to protect Americans who are getting taken advantage of by unscrupulous offers, or you know maybe they believe the offer and maybe it was great, but the market turned mm-hmm. and they lost their money. And now folks who um, should not be investing uh, they should maybe they should invest, but maybe not the amount they invest because they invested too much and they just lost their entire life savings and they don't have the income or the wherewithal to recover and it puts them in poverty. That's right. The if you if if you make if you make a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar investment into a private placement offering and the thing goes to zero or near zero, if you're worth a few million bucks, it hurts, but it doesn't really matter that much. It doesn't ruin your lifestyle. It, it doesn't right. really affect you, uh, your day to day that much. If if you're only worth a quarter of a million dollars, or you're worth a, even a half million dollars, you know that's a huge impact on your life. So I think uh, there's lots of issues with the accredited investor definition. Andy and I actually just did a podcast episode on that a few weeks back. I also did another one with with one of my recent guests on the Alternative Investment Podcast when I was guest hosting in place of Andy. We, we've covered that a couple of times. I would encourage your listeners and viewers to check out those episodes because um, we talked about this ad nauseum, the pros and cons of this definition and and the purpose of the SEC stepping in and playing the role of protector of the, of the everyday Main Street investor. Um, qu- yeah. Quite interesting philosophical discussions that we got into at times. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to check it out because I, I have some pretty, uh, I love the the philosophy behind it. Uh, the the employment it's like the government employs anything it's always uh, yeah. wealthy or yes. you know that's probably not the right way to do it but you know I, I understand what you're trying to do um, it's just how it ends up rolling out um, 
unintended consequences for sure. A lot of unintended consequences. Absolutely. Um, and then one final point there is the accredited investor definition was set in 1982. So if you account for inflation, a million dollars net worth in 1982 looks a whole lot different than it does today in 2023, right? So, oh yeah, if we spent anyways, dollars a month on groceries, that was a lot back then. Yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, do that on Chick Fil A now. <laughs> so, I've really enjoyed having you on this podcast. Um, one thing we didn't really talk about is like impact of the dollars that people invest in these machines. So, uh, we talked about the financial. Um, benefits, the tax benefits of opportunity zones. We, you talked a little bit about, um, not directly, but kind of indirectly of why money is going in there is to improve these places that hadn't rebounded in such a quick fashion. And a 10 year timeline provides plenty of time to get through the market cycle um, without people just running away or losing everything. Um, and so that's kind of why there's a 10 year life cycle, right? They want the same owner to be at the same property for a while, which stabilizes it and keeps it um, running and, and healthy and, and so forth. So the dollars that are getting invested into opportunity zones and the other alternate investments you talk about, um, what impact does that have uh, outside of just a return on investment? Or is there any impact? Well, first of all, there is a return on investment. This is a profit-driven policy incentive. You know, if the government wanted to entice private equity to flow into these communities all around the country that typically lacked that type of investment. This isn't a government grant where the government just writes these locations, huge checks. Uh, it's not a tax credit program per se. Um, it's a tax incentive. So it's structured a little bit differently than some previous economic development programs that uh, the government has has tried to employ. It's it's kind of a brand new system in that regard. It's incentive. It's an incentive for private equity to f equity to flow into these locations. So I think the the spirit of the legislation is to do a few things. Well, primarily it's to generate additional economic activity in some of these areas that have traditionally lacked it. But what does that mean? What does that look like? To to me, it looks like two things. One it's creating jobs in the area, or it's creating um, housing that can support jobs in the area. But either one of those is really saying the same thing, jobs. Can, the, can, the, can, it, can it create more jobs? And can it help the community support more jobs? And to that end, I'm seeing a lot of great progress, just anecdotally, from some of these areas. Um, a lot of the qualified opportunity funds that present uh, at my events are building that type of housing. They're building modular housing mm -hmm. where there's a huge housing shortage. They're building workforce housing for teachers and nurses and uh, firefighters and policemen, right? Right. In these different areas. Um, the second aspect is creating or increasing the tax base of the local jurisdiction. And I think those types of projects that are being developed in opportunity zones are doing just that. Um, whether it's housing or hospitality, hotel or office, you can create that infrastructure, that real estate infrastructure product for folks to move into in these areas. Um, you're going to increase the tax base of the local tax collecting agency, which is going to then be able to offer better services to the community. So, the jury's still out on how effectively opportunity zones are accomplishing these things. Anecdotally, I've seen pretty strong evidence to suggest that in some places, in some areas with some projects, it's absolutely working as intended. And uh, I think we're going to get more data on this and some more hard data on this um, as, as time goes on. It's hard because that uh, data takes time yes. uh, and the more time, the more accurate the data becomes because you can weed out the outliers that don't belong or the inaccurate data that got put in there. I'm, you know, my master's degree was in health policy. I spent a lot of time working with foreign governments um, regarding policies and setting things up um, and unintended consequences were always part of those discussions. 
uh, I also spend, you know, my, my days are in affordable and, you know, workforce housing and doing stuff where institutional cash will not come. So I think about policy a lot. I talk about policy a lot on LinkedIn and some of my other uh, social media, but um, I have found that the opportunity zone uh, policy as a policy, um, it's not sufficient, but it was a really good, uh, not like a college try, um, but it was a really good start uh, in that system. And, um, you know, was happy to see that because once you can align profit um, to those types of things, it makes a huge difference. Now, I completely agree. Humans respond to incentives. If you give them a profit incentive, or in this case, specifically, a tax incentive that can increase the profitability of certain types of projects, you're going to see dollars flow into those, those areas. Yeah, I 100% you know, agree. You just set up the incentives and walk away. That's what the government needs to do. And then private citizens, we will solve those problems once the incentives are lined up. Um, but if you don't, it just, it doesn't happen. I, mean, I agree. Would, yeah. Why would you do it? Go to something easier that's more profitable. Um, well, thank you so much, Jimmy, for being on the show. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. I'm sure we could talk for a very long time about uh, those policies uh, effect, uh, ill effects that have occurred sometimes because it, it does happen. Um, the policy writers are human and then they're stuck in a bunch of a big room with a bunch of, uh, you know, politicians who have various motives. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's good to see those things. And I'm really happy to um, see that you were able to help facilitate that entire process all across America, which is just a resounding impact and help drive capital into those places. Uh, so thanks for the big, heavy impact you've had. Um, there's probably millions of Americans who had no idea that you were involved in that process at all, right? And that's okay, um, but it's awesome. So thank you for being on the show. How can people, I mean, we've already talked about this a lot, but I'll still ask, how can people reach out to you and find you? Well, thanks, Sam. Thanks for having me on. Uh, head over to wealthchannel.com to learn more. We also have a few free guides that are available for investors to download if they want to learn more about alternative investments or a couple of different types of uh, products within the alternative investments universe. You can download those free investor guides at wealthchannel.com slash guides. Awesome. Thank you. We'll make sure that stuff is in the show notes. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us today on another Clean Money podcast, where we talk about impact um, with our investment dollars. Thank you so much, Jimmy. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for tuning in to Clean Money, where we talk about sustainable investing that improves society. We are passionate about creating great investment returns to investors who want to use their money to make a positive social impact in the world. If you enjoyed the episode, we'd appreciate a five-star review. And if you are interested in making your investing matter, please connect with us at wildmountaincapital.com. Or you can find me, Samuel Sells, on LinkedIn, on Twitter at Sells underscore Samuel, on Instagram at Clean Money Sam, or on Facebook. And finally, make your investing matter. <laughs>